Elliot, I think the whole concept of lawyers and judges in this country is they feel they're immune. And as soon as they feel they're immune, then there's the whole thing gets blurred between what's right and what's wrong. And there's nothing wrong with being, you know, criminal in their heads. And it's it's led to the whole country being the whole judicial system being a waste product. So from there, what could you do to pursue your rights? Well, Dick, I'm going to I'm going to get back to this in my story. Um, but what you just said sounds like Nazi Germany, where once the Nazis took over the government in a coup and, you know, the Reichstag fire similar to the World Trade Center's got everybody fired up for, you know, protect the country, give up our rights, give up our sovereignties, um, trust the government, um, you can see that the first thing a criminal coup on a government does is subvert the, the courts. And, you know, I always remind people uh, and the courts and these lawyers that, you know, in Nuremberg there was a trial of the judges and the lawyers who said it was okay to do all these crimes and put people in gas chambers. And they were tried and convicted for life. And I'll get to that in a minute because I think that's an important point. But let me answer your question about what I did to pursue my rights. Uh, I just think it's very spooky that you even see uh, the damage this coup has done to our moral, uh, our morals, to, to, to the Constitution. Uh, since really taking over the full government back in the Bush v. Gore election. But anyways, to pursue my rights, and before I knew all that, stuff was going on. Um, due to the conflicts and the violations of attorney conduct codes and the violations of the judicial canons and violations of federal and state laws that took place in the Labarga court, uh, by Labarga and Proskauer, who, by the way, is always Proskauer was, was representing themselves in that case um, while being my attorneys, which is just such a conflict that you have to wonder how the judge even allowed them to represent themselves, especially once he had the counter complaint that showed that the Proskauer lawyers that were standing in his court might very well have fraud at the patent office who was investigating patent fraud. But anyways... Um, you know, leaving La Barga, uh, obviously without giving him a moon, I probably would have landed in jail. Uh, we first filed a Florida bar complaint uh, against the Proskauer attorneys. And then we filed New York disciplinary complaints against Rubenstein for his perjury. He's a New York licensed attorney. Wheeler's here in Florida. And Dick is in Virginia where we filed a Virginia bar complaint. And uh, we filed against Foley, Dick, Wheeler, Joa, Rubenstein, the whole gang in Florida, New York, and Virginia. So that was the first strike, Dick. We also filed a judicial conduct complaint against our friend, uh, the man who stole democracy, Jorge Labarga, and we filed that with the Judicial Qualifications Commission. And then, Dick, we went federal on and I filed complaints with Harry Motes, the director of the U.S. Patent Office, Office of Enrollment and Discipline, who I mentioned oversights all intellectual property attorneys that are registered with the federal U.S. Patent Office. And that's a special bar outside the state bars. Uh, to be a patent attorney, uh, you have to register federally. So all his violations are federal, all these patent attorneys. You know, these false oaths, these are very serious crimes they've committed. So once Moats saw the depositions from the Labarga case with the perjured statements from Rubenstein and, in fact, saw a patent portfolio prepared by the attorneys for the Wachovia private placement uh, that Bill Dick submitted in his Virginia Bar complaint, well, when Moats got it, he saw that on the docket, and he was looking at the actual patent filings versus the attorney dockets, that everything was wrong, that the inventors were wrong, versus the information he had. The assignees were wrong. The owners were wrong. This, was, this confirmed that basically what AOL and Warner Brothers had discovered, that the patents on file with the U.S. Patent Office were wholly different, 
And not only different, there were false inventors, false owners, false assignees, all of these things. So Motes, at that point, uh, he moved to get the crime reported to federal officials, and, and including the commissioner of the patent office, and to help me get my patents suspended with the um, U.S. Patent Office. He actually uh, put together immediately a, a patent team of uh, six or seven U.S. Uh, patent officials who aided, excuse me, who, who aided me in uh, getting my patents into suspension and immediately removed all the prior attorneys from access to the patent information. So he basically fired Foley, uh, Proskauer, Dick, all of them. Uh, I then worked to Dick, and I believe this might be the first time in history, uh, with the U.S. Patent Office officers to file the necessary documents to respond to the outstanding office actions on all these intellectual properties, the fraudulent ones, ours, everything. And virtually overnight, I had to become my own patent attorney, although they helped me greatly, and they're, you know, patent attorneys. Uh, and when the IP was ready for suspension, Motes advised me, me, Dick, to file charges, not a fraud on Elliot Bernstein, but fraud upon the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and to make that filing with the Commissioner of Patents. And Crossbow Ventures CEO Stephen Warner, he signed on the dotted line with me with the other inventors that, you know, fraud had taken place, that we were the true and proper inventors, owners, and assignees. And so, you know, with that, Motes began... Um, investigation, and lo and behold, the commissioner approved the suspension request, and the patents remain suspended today, Dick, uh, years later, and that's wholly outside of patent law. I mean, you're only truly allowed three, six-month suspension. I'm going on years, and the patent office stopped communicating with me at this point because they claim they're in an ongoing investigation including with, as you'll learn in here, with uh, members of the FBI. So that's how we started, Dick, to pursue our rights. In fact, some of the patents that were, that were, that Modes had with others' names on them, like Zoom and Pan, for example, on a digital camera. Imagine that, Dick. The invention Zoom and Pan on a digital camera. Um, Which every camera has now. <laughs> Every camera in the world, every medical device, every telescope, everything, um, was in Brian Utley's sole name. So I wasn't an inventor. None of the real inventors were inventors. But Brian Utley, who wasn't even there during the invention, was the inventor. But what that did was that set up a huge problem that Motes had to direct us to actually seek an act of Congress because we can't make changes to those stolen patents because the patent law precludes us from even getting information on those patents. Only the inventors, owners, and assignments can get the information, but when it's a fraud. So Motes has sent me to Congress, and I've um, taken some steps. I'll explain those in a minute. Um, but he basically wants us to change patent law to allow him to disclose the information on the fraudulent patents to us. And um, due to the uh, laws, he can't. So we turned to uh, the Honorable Senator uh, Diane Feinstein in California. And as her offices have become involved, they contacted federal authorities regarding many of the facets of the case, including our request for new legislation which we drafted for her, which would allow us to change the stolen patents back to the true and proper inventors.